We're going to talk about genetically modified food today. Since this is being videotaped, I want you to know for the people who are going to be watching later that I consider this my advanced presentation. So the information that I'm going to be sharing with you is primarily coming from these books written by this man, Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey Smith, I consider to be the person who knows more about genetically modified food than anyone in the world, really. When they first started doing this whole genetically modified food thing back in the 90s, Jeffrey Smith started educating himself and started educating other people. And I believe it's largely because of his efforts to get the ball rolling to educate people that now we are in the place we are where a lot of people are demanding to have labeling or GMO free food. So thanks to him. So who knows what foods are genetically modified? Just call it out. Corn. Yes. Corn. Yes. Good. You guys remember. Very good. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to know. For those of you who were at my other talk, do you remember? So I want you to remember this. Soy, corn, cottonseed, canola. And I want you to say it. Soy, corn, cottonseed, canola. Soy, corn, cottonseed, canola. So when you go to the grocery store, how are you going to know what's genetically modified? If you remember that and you're reading the labels on your packaged food, soy, corn, cottonseed, canola, that'll help you remember what it is you're looking for on that product label. So soy, corn, cottonseed, canola are all in vegetable oil. So if you are looking at a list of ingredients and it says vegetable oil, you can count on that that's what's going to be in there and it's going to be genetically modified. Soy and corn are in huge numbers of different forms in all sorts of packaged foods. And cotton is really, food-wise, just used for cottonseed oil and then canola. We also have sugar beet. So if you buy sugar and it just says sugar, it's going to have genetically modified sugar beet in it. If it says 100% cane sugar, then you know that it's just cane and not genetically modified sugar beet. We also have most of the Hawaiian papaya that is genetically modified, unfortunately, just from Hawaii. And then a small amount of zucchini and crookneck squash. Small amounts. I, that's not one that I really worry about. That's a pretty minor crop. Unfortunately, alfalfa has been approved, which means that I, you know, I don't know if they're actually feeding it to livestock yet, but soon genetically modified alfalfa, Roundup Ready alfalfa, will be fed to livestock. Which how, how, when did that happen? That was just passed. That was just passed. So that means that animal products, meat, dairy, that are fed the animals were fed that genetically modified alfalfa, as far as I'm concerned, is suddenly now genetically modified. And I'm not sure whether or not salmon has actually been approved. That's one that's been you know, out there for a while. So that's what's been genetically modified. So this is why we have this whole issue to deal with. This is the FDA's official policy since 1992. The agency is not aware of any information showing that foods derived by these new methods differ from other foods in any meaningful or uniform way. That's our, official government's our, our government's official policy. So what that means is that they are saying that as of 1992, they had no evidence that genetically modified and non-genetically modified crops are any different. Their words are that they are substantially equivalent. So that means that the plant is the same, genetically modified and non-genetically modified. That there is no difference in effect on you when you eat it or on an animal when they eat it. That it's the same. On the basis of this statement, the FDA said that no safety testing was necessary. If Monsanto or other biotechnology food companies say their foods are safe, the FDA has no further questions. <laughs> they take the corporation's word for it. Well, why not? Yeah. <laughs> In reality, the FDA's own scientists, before that policy was approved, had real concerns. They said, hey, there are a lot, they're not the same. There's potential for new allergens, 
new toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. And the FDA scientists said these should be studied before being released to the public. They had real concerns about them. So who overruled the scientists? The man in charge of FDA policy was Michael Taylor. He was Monsanto's former attorney and later their vice president. <laughs> the White House under George H.W. Bush instructed the FDA to promote the biotechnology industry. And that's still our government's policy, right? Promoting biotech. The FDA created a new position for Michael Taylor. As a result of the policy that he oversaw, if Monsanto and others want to put a GM crop on the market, technically they don't even have to tell the FDA. The companies do participate in a voluntary and highly superficial consultation process with the FDA in which they offer just summary data and their own conclusions of safety. So again, the FDA trusts them when they interpret their own studies and the FDA doesn't do studies by themselves. Now, the Obama administration has reinstalled Michael Taylor at the FDA as the U.S. food safety czar. <laughs> I don't trust him to guard my food safety. But, you know, it's like the whole revolving door. Yes. Corporate government, corporate government. So this man is Dr. Arpad Pustai. And back in the early 90s, he was awarded a grant in the U.K. This guy is the man who is the expert in feeding studies. If you want to determine whether some food is safe, he's the man to develop the studies. And so they gave him this big grant to develop feeding studies for testing genetically modified food. And he was very early in his process. He genetically modified a potato that would make its own insecticide. And he was interviewed on UK TV and they showed three minutes, or three, 30, uh, very short, three minutes, three or 30 seconds, I'm not sure how long it was, of his talk on TV. There was a big media fuss. And two days later, when he went to work, he was fired. The UK Prime Minister called the director of his institute and had him fired. They shut down his lab. They told him all the studies were stopped and he couldn't have access to his data. He couldn't talk to the press. So he was shut down. But the UK um, Parliament decided after that whole media fuss that they actually wanted to talk to him. So that lifted the gag order and then they, he was able to talk to the media and it was a big fuss in the media again. Shortly thereafter, they have labeling required in the UK. And when that happened, all the companies said, well, people are going to buy our food if it's labeled. So they then said, OK, we'll be GMO free. Those very same companies no. in the European Union that are GMO free still have GMOs in their food here because there hasn't been the demand here. So we're creating that demand now. But what you do with your dollars when you go to the store makes a difference. How you spend your money communicates to those companies, we don't want this stuff. And, uh, how many of you have heard about the California labeling initiative, right? If you know anybody in California, educate them. Get them out to vote. And I encourage people to donate to the Organic Consumers, Cons Organic Consumers Association, the primary organization that is helping educate people down in California because the biotechnology companies are spending mega bucks, big money to fight this initiative. So if labeling becomes required in California, we're all going to have labeling because they're not going to have separate packaging for all the other states. So uh, I really encourage you to support that. And I know a lot of people in this community do work with energy. Get that labeling initiative passed in California. So let's look at what Dr. Pustai found. So he fed rats potatoes. There was one group that had the genetically modified potatoes. Another group that had potatoes that were not genetically modified and they added the pesticide to it. And then a third group that had regular potatoes. The group that ate the genetically modified potatoes was seriously damaged. The potato spike with the insecticides did not show problems. So it's not the insecticide. Because the group that ate the potatoes that they added the insecticide to were fine. It was only the group that ate the genetically modified potatoes that got sick. These rats developed potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, 
partial atrophy of the liver, and damaged immune systems. So a lot of physiological effects. And you can see that all of that occurred within 10 to 110 days. You're looking at four months. Serious damage to the bodies of these poor rats. So over the long term, who knows how much effect there is going to be. Let's look at the stomach lining of these rats. On the left, you have the rats that ate the regular potatoes. And then on the right, you have the rats that had the genetically modified potato. So look at how much more tissue there is. That's called cell proliferation. That's a precancerous sign. When your cells are overgrowing, there could potentially be cancer down the road. So let's talk about what sorts of traits they put into these plants. There are two primary traits engineered into genetically modified soy, corn, cotton, and canola. The first is herbicide tolerance. The genetically modified crops are inserted with a gene that allows them to survive applications of a particular herbicide. How many of you heard of Roundup? Most commonly used herbicide. Monsanto sells Roundup ready crops, which are engineered to survive applications of this herbicide. The buyers sign a contract saying they will only use Monsanto's brand of herbicide with their crop. So this is a big money maker for the companies. They make money by selling this fancy seed, and then they have a monopoly on the herbicide that gets used. The other ma major trait is pesticide production, in which every cell of the plant produces an insect-killing toxin. Some crops have both of those traits. We'll talk more about those. Then, the next most common trait is virus resistance. Those Hawaiian papaya and the zucchini and crookneck squash are all engineered to be able to fight viruses that are specific to those species. The viral proteins might suppress our own body's viral defenses, or the proteins themselves could be toxic. Farmers, scientists, and others report that when given a choice, a large variety of animals avoid eating GM foods including cows, pigs, geese, squirrel, elk, deer, raccoons, buffalo, mice, and rats. Animals are smarter than we are, because most people can't tell that there's a difference when they eat a genetically modified food. Here's an example of animals. So there's a farmer who read in one of Jeffrey Smith's books about this animal thing. And so he bought a bag of genetically modified corn, and then a bag of non-genetically modified corn, and he put them in his shed, and he forgot about it. And then when he went back into his shed, he found that the rats and mice had done the study for him. Because you can see that there's one bag, the non-genetically modified bag, where there's no corn left. All there is is cobs. The genetically modified corn on the right still looks perfect. The mice and rats could tell the difference. They didn't want to eat that garbage. So a lot of what we're talking about today is the science. So the information about the science is best covered in, in Jeffrey Smith's book, Genetic Roulette. I've been reading this book, and it's like horrifying and fascinating at the same time. A lot of what we're going to talk about is centered around DNA. Everybody knows what DNA is? That's the blueprint that tells the plant what it's supposed to do and your body what it's supposed to do. And so they do all this by m manipulating the DNA. So how does genetic engineering work? They isolate the gene for a desirable quality in bacteria, viruses, or other sources. They change it so it'll work in plants. They prepare the plant cells for insertion of the gene. And they use a gun, actually, to shoot it at a plate of cells. They may also use bacteria to infect the plants with the foreign gene. Once the gene gets into the DNA of the plant cell, the cell is cloned into a full plant. So out of all of these, the only one of these steps that does not cause potential mutations and damage is the preparing the plant cells. Everything else, including the cloning, has potential for mutations to occur. So within the tissues of the plant are cells. Within each cell is a nucleus. Within that are chromosomes, which are composed of the DNA molecule, which in turn is made up of a sequence of base pairs. A simplistic description is a sequence of the genes in the DNA determines the sequence in the RNA, which then determines the sequence of the building blocks of proteins called amino acids. These proteins can determine a particular trait or characteristic. 
This represents the transgene or gene construct that is inserted. Scientists want to create a corn plant that produces its own pesticide. They take a gene from bacteria that produces its own pesticide. The bacteria are called Bt for Bacillus thuringiensis. The toxin it creates is Bt toxin. If you take the pesticide producing Bt gene from the bacteria and put that inside corn by itself, it doesn't work. Plant DNA is designed to turn genes on and off as needed by the cell. But there is no corn on Earth that has ever had this Bt gene before genetic engineering. The corn plant doesn't know how to turn it on. So they attach a promoter, usually taken from the cauliflower mosaic virus, which acts as an on switch. It turns the gene on 24 hours every day a week. This Bt gene is not under the control of the DNA. It is under the control of this inserted viral promoter. On the other side of the gene, scientists attach a stop signal that tells the cell, gene ends here, stop reading it. So how do they tell which cells got the new gene? They added antibiotic resistance into what they inserted into the DNA. And so they doused the plate with antibiotics. And all the cells that aren't killed by the antibiotics are the ones that got the new gene. And so they take those and they turn those into plants. So all those plants that grow after the application of the antibiotic are the ones that got the new gene inserted into them. So you're messing with DNA. There's all kinds of potential for mutations. Everybody knows what a mutation is, right? Mistakes in the DNA that cause the DNA to not work properly. These mutations can occur during the insertion process when they're shooting the DNA at the plate. During the cloning process, it, the cells are also really smart. And it's trying to repair itself and rearrange things in an attempt to get back to normal function. So the change could occur really at any time. Plant DNA sequences are both longer and different from bacterial DNA. The process of inserting a transgene causes mutations or changes in the sequence of the genetic code near the insertion site and elsewhere. Inserting the transgene can delete natural native genes. In one study, 13 genes were deleted by a single insertion. Sometimes the transgene will be embedded in the middle of a native gene, changing its function. Native genes can be switched off permanently or even turned on permanently. The biotechnology industry claims that the promoter they insert will only turn on the transgene, which is not true. The promoter can turn on other genes downstream from the transgene permanently. It could cause it to overproduce a protein in high volume, which could be an allergen, toxin, carcinogen, or anti-nutrient. The process of cloning a cell into a plant can create hundreds or thousands of additional mutations up and down the DNA. According to two studies, the genetically modified DNA is 2 to 4% different than the DNA of its parent. Most of the changes are unpredicted mutations. Inserting a single gene can change how much protein is being produced in hundreds or thousands of genes. Scientists tested the process of inserting a single gene into a human cell and found, up, found that up to 5% of the genes changed their levels of expression. Genetic engineering causes massive collateral damage in the plant. Biotechnology industry scientists and regulators operate as if the genes were like Legos that cleanly snap into place and operate independently of other genes in the DNA. So the scientists say, you can just put them together, Lego blocks, and that they function exactly the way they intend. But of course, it doesn't happen that way. I talked about, back, you know, I didn't explain this fully. So when we eat an apple, the DNA for that apple never mixes with my own DNA. It doesn't mix with the ba bacteria in my intestines, the DNA. Bacteria has DNA that is much closer to our DNA. And the, it's like everybody know that bacteria communicate with each other. They're mutating all the time, and they communicate the mutation from one bacteria to another bacteria. 
That's part of why antibiotic resistance is becoming such a problem. A bacteria mutates so that it's no longer susceptible to the antibiotic, and then it communicates that antibiotic resistance to other bacteria. So bacteria are always exchanging DNA fragments, mixing up DNA, changing things, trying to, sur trying to survive whatever we throw at them. Okay? So part of the problem with the genetic engineering is that when they insert these DNA segments into the plant DNA, there's always going to be some bacterial DNA in there. These segments that they're inserting contain bacterial DNA. And the cells and the bacteria, it's like it tends to jump around and change itself and share with other bacteria what it is that they have learned. So it's possible for the bacteria in the food that's been genetically modified to jump into that DNA segment, to jump into the bacteria in your gut bacteria. So that's a big problem. It's like that's how these whole mutation things, once it's already in place, can occur. It's always rearranging and communicating with other bacteria. So the presumption that it's this building block way of functioning within the DNA is not true. DNA creates RNA, and the RNA creates proteins. Proteins interact and create all the hundreds and thousands of natural products that make plants unique. Each element in this process could be altered as a result of the unpredicted changes in the DNA. And really, it's all about proteins. These are all amino acids. Everybody knows what amino acids are? They're the components that make up proteins. So it's like the DNA makes RNA, and the RNA tells your body, your cells, what proteins to make. And when it comes to proteins, it's all about shape. Proteins function in your body very precisely. And when they go to, go to a receptor site on a cell, for example, the shape of the protein influences whether or not it's going to be able to fit in the receptor site on the cell. So you can see that these amino acids are all different shapes. When you have a mutation in the DNA, right, that then results in a change in the structure of a protein, the shape of the protein is going to be different because the shape of the amino acids that make up the protein are different. So it's like if you have these different side chains branching off all these different ways, the protein folds itself up very precisely to be able to serve the function that it needs to serve. When you change the shape of the amino acids that make up the protein, that folding is all different, which then affects the ability of that protein to function. So even if the DNA itself has not been mutated, and it comes out exactly the way they intend, okay? The protein itself that is produced in the end could be harmful. An example of this is the Roundup Ready protein that is engineered to be tolerant to the herbicide Roundup. This, prote this protein is potentially an allergen. Let's look at Bt pesticide. This is a gene from, um, there's a soil bacteria that creates Bt toxin, which kills specific insects. In its natural form, this is used in organic and conventional agriculture and forestry. It is allowed in food because of the assumption it has a history of safe use. They assume the protein is destroyed during digestion and that it won't interact with mammals or humans. We don't have receptor sites on our cells for Bt toxin. So they say, it's not going to react with your body at all. It won't absorb at all, or you'll just digest it and it'll go out. It won't cause a problem. These assumptions are incorrect. People do react to BT spray. Studies show reactions among farmers, including antibody responses to BT in the blood. Any of you remember when they did gypsy moth spraying and people reacted to it? They were using BT spray. About 500 people at that time reported allergic reactions, and some had to be hospitalized. Bt toxin does survive digestion. When fed to mice, the lower part of their small intestines suffered tissue damage, damaged cells, and potentially precancerous growth. Mice developed an immune response as if they had been fed cholera toxin. They were also sensitized to other compounds that they never reacted to before, which occurs with as occurs with multiple chemical sensitivity. So this is Bt toxin all by itself, not even the genetically modified version. 
the Bt in crops is probably far more dangerous than the spray. The spray biodegrades or can be washed off. In the genetically modified crops, it is produced inside every cell and cannot be washed off or degraded. It is produced in concentrations that can be three to 5,000 times more than when it's in spray form. Bt toxin in plants is designed to be more toxic than natural Bt. The natural Bt pesticide molecule has a safety catch on it, which keeps it inactive. When an insect eats it, the safety catch is removed, and the Bt destroys the stomach lining of the pest and kills it. When scientists prepare the Bt gene for plants, they take off the safety catch, so it is immediately active. This is likely to be more toxic to humans. The amino acid structure of the Bt toxin has a section that is identical to a known allergen. Let's look at Bt in an actual crop. In India, hundreds of laborers picking cotton and working in cotton ginning factories developed allergic reactions when handling Bt cotton. After the cotton is harvested, shepherds take their flocks into the area to graze on the Bt plants. Within five to seven days, one out of four sheep died. Thousands died overall. <coughs> Medical investigators found black patches in the intestine, liver, and bile ducts. There was nasal discharge, sense of dullness, depression, diarrhea, and coughing among the sheep. So these poor farmers, they live subsistence lifestyles. So they can't afford to lose their animals. How many have heard of the thousands of farmers who have been committing suicide in India? So unfortunately, it's primarily Bt cotton that is available in India. And they promised the farmers that they wouldn't have to use the pesticides to kill the bullworm. They wouldn't have to use the pesticides. And they promised them high yields. Unfortunately, neither of those are proving out to be the case. So they get low yields. And um, in one of the videos I have out there, you see a, a farmer look at his cotton plant. And there's very few cotton balls on it. Should be lots. He picks off a cotton ball. And you can see the bullworm crawling around on it. So it's not being killed by, by the genetically modified cotton. And so they're still having a spray, and they're not having the yield. So these poor farmers are not able to, to survive, and they're committing suicide primarily by drinking the pesticide. It's just, it's horrendous. Thousands of thousands of farmers every year are just committing suicide. It's just horrendous. Let's look at Bt corn. Oh, let's, let's go back to, to this. So these farmers have been letting their their livestock graze on the cotton plants for years before genetic modification, and it was fine. And then they eat the Bt cotton plants, and that's it. So it's not the cotton that causes the problems with the animals. It's the Bt. Let's look at corn. Farmers in the Midwest claim that their pigs and cows became sterile when they were feeding them certain varieties of Bt corn. Some pigs developed false pregnancies and gave birth to bags of water. This is becoming a real problem for livestock farmers. They're not able to make a living. And they're finding that when they switch to non-genetically modified feed, that their animals are fine. So, In the Philippines, villagers adjacent to a BC BT cornfield developed serious health problems. A man went into the field to investigate and had a serious reaction. His whole face swelled up, and he had trouble breathing. That poor man still has not recovered. The protein created by the inserted gene could be different than it was intended. The specific sequence of the inserted gene dictates the sequence of amino acids. If the sequence changes, so does the protein. The inserted gene can mutate or truncate during the insertion process. The transgenes may be unstable and rearrange over time long after the crops have gone to market. Labs analyzed the transgene sequence in six genetically modified crops and found that in every case, the sequence is different than that which was registered with the biotechnology company. So what that's saying, it changes after the fact. One of these crops could be on the market for 10 years, and it rearranges. So it'll continue to possibly rearrange over time. Even if the transgene is properly inserted and is stable, the DNA can be read differently than it was intended. Produce, producing different or multiple proteins. It could also produce harmful RNA. Suppose the transgene sequence turns out to be identical to what they want. 
that it remains stable, and that it produces the amino acid sequence of the protein that you intended, you still could have a problem. Proteins get folded, and the folding might be different in the new organism. A protein's shape determines its effect. A misfolded protein or an aggregate of several misfolded proteins together can be harmful. Prions are a misfolded protein that is responsible for mad cow disease and the human variant. Amyloid fibrils are aggregate proteins linked to a variety of medical conditions, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. <coughs> proteins can also have molecular attachments that alter their function. Added sugar chains, called glycosylation, can turn a harmless protein into a deadly one that creates allergic reactions. This could be what happened in genetically modified peas. In Australia, a gene from a kidney bean was inserted into peas to kill the pea weevil. The developers did a test. They did a test that no other GM food crop developer had done. So they did a test that isn't normally done on these crops. They exposed mice to the proteins from the kidney beans with no reaction. They expected the same thing to happen when mice were exposed to the protein produced by the peas. The amino acid sequence was identical in the proteins produced by the bean and the pea. So the amino acid, the string of amino acids that make the protein was exactly the same in the kidney beans as in their genetically modified pea. But the mice developed a dangerous inflammatory immune response to the protein produced in the GM peas. This suggests that the peas might create deadly anaphylactic shock or other immune or inflammatory reactions in humans. Fortunately, they never marketed the peas. But they did studies that don't normally get done. If they hadn't decided to do this new study, they would be on the market now, potentially causing harm to people. And it's like when they actually studied the protein itself, they found that inside the peas, it was attaching different sugar molecules to the outside of the protein that caused it to fold differently. That's what was causing the problem. It wasn't the protein all by itself. The sequence is exactly the same. It's what the pea plant did to it, put these sugar molecules on, that caused the problem. And they can't predict what's going to happen with that. Another problem is that more herbicide residues will be present on herbicide-tolerant crops. Two primary herbicides used on these crops are Roundup and Liberty, with the active ingredients being glyphosate and glyphosinate. The overuse of herbicides on these crops has resulted in the creation of herbicide-tolerant weeds. Farmers respond by increasing the dosage. The use of herbicides like Roundup was up 31% in that one year. So you can see that first one is just the increase of Roundup alone. And because the, the weeds are becoming resistant to the herbicide, they are now using more toxic herbicides. So 2,4-D, which is a component of Agent Orange, is now being increasingly used. And if you spend a lot of time doing this stuff on the internet, you've probably gotten petitions saying, you know, they're trying to have 2,4-D resistant plants, right? So it's like they have Roundup resistance, it's not working anymore, so now let's be resistant to the application of this component of Agent Orange. So they're going to be using more and more of that more toxic herbicide if they get that approved. So anytime, you know, a petition comes by your computer saying, it was like, no 2,4-D corn, you want to put your name on that. Let's talk about Roundup in particular. How many of you heard of the, the weird things that are going on associated with Roundup in soil? And so there's a new organism that has been discovered that scientists believe was probably in the soil before, but they just hadn't identified it, that they are finding is proliferating in soil that has, been, that has had Roundup applied to it over the course of years. And this man does some really good interviews with, um, on Dr. McCullough's website, talking about the effects of the Roundup and this weird new organism. They don't even know what kind of organism it is. It's not a bacteria. It's not a virus. It's not anything that they've ever been able to identify before. So um, they're, they're studying it and finding that it's contributing to a lot of um, health problems in, in livestock. So Roundup works by chelating the minerals. Does everybody know what that is, chelating minerals? It attaches to the minerals so that the minerals are not available for the plant or for the animal that eats the plant. 
the Roundup accumulates in plant tissues. So they apply the Roundup multiple times, and it just more and more and more of it winds up being incorporated into the, the tissue joints and into the plant itself. So when you eat a Roundup ready crop, you're getting all the Roundup that has been applied to that plant. You're eating some of that. The Roundup kills the beneficial soil microorganisms. So all the things that make the soil healthy, those are actually living organisms down in the soil. And the Roundup kills them. It makes benign organisms potentially lethal, like this weird soil organism that they've recently discovered. Probably was there before, not causing a problem. But because Roundup actually increases the viability of these other non-beneficial organisms, they can start causing problems. There's all sorts of uh, plant diseases that farmers used to have under control that are now getting out of control because the Roundup is affecting the whole metabolism of the soil and the plant. And so they're now having to struggle against these plant diseases that they used to have managed. And it negatively impacts all areas of health by depleting minerals in the plants and in the animals. It affects everything. Let's look at some plants. So this one graph looks at the amount of minerals taken up into the plant with and without the Roundup. And then you're looking at plants. So the, the group of plants on the left, that field has had Roundup applied for one year. The one on the right has had Roundup applied for 10 years. And these are wheat plants. Same age of plants. So look at the difference in the ability of those plants to grow when the application of Roundup has been over the long term. There are some slides on uh, the Institute for Responsible Technologies website where they show where, and it's like they use you know, machines to apply this stuff. And they, they drive around the rows like this. And on the ends, you can see where there has been relatively more um, herbicide applied because it turns the corner, so there's more applied on the end than in the middle. So the ends of the fields are brown, and the rest of the field is greener because the plants on the end have had more herbicide applied to them over time, and it winds up being in the soil and all that. So the plants on the ends are not as healthy as the ones in the middle. They're also finding a lot of problems with reproductive failure in the livestock that are eating the genetically modified crops. There's a new organism that we talked about, the new organism. So the new organism, they are finding that it is showing up in livestock feed, and that they are linking that to the problems that they're having with animals not being able to reproduce. So you imagine, you know, you're a pig farmer, and you need to breed your, you know, breed your pigs to have baby pigs so you have more pigs. They're not able to, to breed. So a lot of times they wind up like having very, very low percentages of pregnancy in, in all of the livestock that they have been feeding these genetically modified crops. They're failing. Reproductive failures first started in 1998. And all of this, um, Dr. Huber on the Mercola video talks all about this. 70% 70, 70 abortion in dairy herds and the premature aging of livestock. He talks about um, when they actually cut into one of these animals that has been eating the genetically modified feed. And it's like a two-year-old animal, I'm just guessing on the numbers, a two-year-old animal looks like it's eight years old. So premature aging in the animals coming from this genetically modified feed they're giving them. Another possible problem is that the transgene, the gene that they insert, might transfer to our own gut bacteria or into our own cell's DNA. Plant sequences are longer and quite different from bacterial DNA. Genetically modified crops have transgenes from bacteria inserted into their DNA that it can readily transfer to gut bacteria. If natural plant genes were to transfer to bacteria, they probably wouldn't function for two reasons. Embedded within plant genes are non-coding portions called introns. So when a plant, they have sections that tell it not to produce this protein. Although plants remove the introns before creating the RNA and protein, bacteria would not likely know how to read the genes with introns. Plant promoters or on switches do not generally work in bacteria. So all this explains why plant DNA in our bodies wouldn't cause a problem. 
GM transgenes have no embedded introns and use a promoter that does work in bacteria. Plant-based plant foods do not contribute genes into our gut bacteria. GM crops might do so regularly, colonizing our gut flora. If the transgene continue to function, it could produce GM proteins continuously inside us. So there has been one human feeding study published, one, on genetically modified crops. So what they did was they fed um, some volunteers who had colostomy bags. You know what a colostomy bag is? Where their intestines don't work properly, basically. And so they could uh, take the food that was digested out of the colostomy bag and find out what was going on in their intestines. And they fed these volunteers um, a genetically modified soy burger and a genetically modified soy milkshake. They tested it before they gave them the burger and the milkshake and found that the bacteria in their intestines were making the Roundup Ready protein even before they gave them the burger and milkshake. That means it was in there, in their gut bacteria from some previous time that they had soy. We don't know how long it will continue to function in your gut bacteria. It could be forever. We don't know. What could transfer? The promoter or the on switch. It can permanently turn on genes, forcing them to overproduce proteins around the clock. Could be allergens, toxins, anti-nutrients, or carcinogens produced by our own gut bacteria and possibly from within our own cell's DNA. If antibiotic resistant genes transfer, they could create super diseases. We know the Roundup Ready gene transfers from soybeans. Other herbicide resistance genes could transfer. The gene for making pesticides like Bt could transfer. And virus resistant genes could transfer from zucchini, papaya, and crookneck squash. If the, BT gene, if the BT gene transfers, it could theoretically turn our intestinal flora into living pesticide factories, possibly for the long term. So when we talked about BT earlier, it breaks up your digestive system and makes it so your digestive doesn't work, so that the bugs, in their case, die. How many more people have digestive problems than used to? Really becoming a problem. Is it contributed to by the fact that we have these genetically modified pesticides being made in people's bodies? We don't know. Let's look at a case of Roundup Ready soy and see how all these things we talked about could be showing up. When the transgene was inserted, a section of soy DNA next to the insertion site got scrambled and mutated. It no longer resembles natural soy DNA. Two extra transgene fra fragments were inserted. So the DNA was not as they intended it to be. There have been unpredicted changes in the soybeans composition. Higher levels of the anti-nutrient called soy lectin, which can block absorption of nutrients. There is an increase in a known soy allergen called trypsin inhibitor. In Monsanto's own study of cooked GM soy, there was as much as a seven times increase in trypsin inhibitor compared to non-GM soy. A seven-fold increase of a known allergen? They left that information out of the report on the study but it was discovered later and made public. Lignin, the woody substance in many plants, was increased in GM soy. They found this because the stems of soybean plants were cracking in the heat. GM soy has reduced proteins, reduced fatty acid, and a reduced essential amino acid. Reduced phytoestrogens, which our culture tells us is good for fighting cancer and heart disease. All of these are examples of the first category of problems unpredicted changes in the DNA, which can create changes in the nutrients, allergens, toxins, and anti-nutrients. The protein itself may be harmful. In the amino acid sequence of the protein produced by Roundup Ready transgene, a section is identical to a known dust mite allergen. GM soy fails the World Health Organization's recommendations designed to keep allergenic GMOs off the market. The proteins could be altered. The transgene creates a strand of RNA, which creates a protein. The RNA strand that they studied was much longer than it was supposed to be. The genetic stop signal, which is inserted to tell the cell to stop reading, the gene ends here, did not work properly. It continued to read the DNA found beyond the transgene. 
The stop signal used in GM soybeans is used in most other GM foods, which means that they, are all, they could also be manu malfunctioning. The RNA strand was further processed, meaning chopped up and recombined by the plant, into four variations, each with a different sequence. Those RNA variations might create unintended proteins, which could be harmful. So those are all examples of ways in which the way the technology intended for this whole plant thing to work was not working the way they said it would. Herbicide tolerant crops have resulted in massive increases in herbicide use. Application of Roundup increases fusarium, both on the roots of soy and wheat. This creates microtoxins, which could be dangerous for humans. So fusarium is one of those organisms they used to have under control that now is causing big problems. Roundup chelates minerals, making them unavailable for the plants and for the animals and humans who eat them. The last category is gene transfer. We know from the experiment described earlier about the soy burger that at least part of the soy gene transferred to gut bacteria and continued to function. So we have seen how all five of the potential problems with GMOs that we talked about have been found in Roundup Ready Soy. What do we know about GM soy's impact on health? Soon after GM soy was introduced into the UK, soy allergies skyrocketed by 50%. They don't know for sure if it's because of the GM soy, but I think it's certainly worth looking at. In a small study, one person had a skin prick reaction to GM soy, but not to non-GM soy, indicating allergic reactions, suggesting that GM soybeans have a different allergen profile. They found a new protein in GM soy that probably resulted from the genetic engineering process. This protein bound with antibodies, suggesting it could be a dangerous allergen. Mice fed GM soy for eight months, had all sorts of digestive disturbances and gene expression altered, could increase allergies. The impaired digestion could increase allergic response to many proteins. The new allergen created might cause reactions. There's a seven-fold increase in the allergen trypsin inhibitor. GM soy has higher levels of herbicide residues, which could trigger reactions. The Roundup Ready protein has properties of a known allergen. And the soy transgene transfers to human gut bacteria. So it's possible that we can have an allergen continuously made by our intestinal flora. Mice that were fed Roundup Ready soy for eight months showed all these changes in their bodies, showing the liver cells. So if they're the same, no difference between GM and non-GM, there should be no difference in the tissue. But you can see that the cell wall is different. The cell just looks different. Rats fed GM soy showed changed color in their testicles and changes in the cell structure. Testicles of mice fed GM soy had all sorts of problems that are affecting development and sperm development and function. A senior scientist from the Russian National Academy of Sciences fed female rats GM soy starting two weeks before conception through pregnancy and lactation. More than 50% of the offspring died within three weeks. Of the offspring whose mothers were fed non-GM soy, only one in 10 died within the same period. And look at the babies. So the babies who ate the non-GM soy are the group up at the top. They all look the same. They look happy. They're a little family. But look at the ones in the GM group. They all look different. They don't look healthy. They don't, these are all the same age. They don't look healthy. They're not friendly. They're aggressive, actually. And they don't socialize well. So look at the difference in the ability of the GM soy to be able to support baby's life. These are all 19 days old. And the smaller rats were the ones that got the GM soy. So that scientist did a small follow-up study. They tried to mate the offspring of the GM group, and they wouldn't conceive at all. How many people are having problems conceiving and having healthy babies? Increasingly a problem. The Russian rat study was small and preliminary. We cannot say conclusively that a Roundup Ready diet causes damage to offspring. The scientists repeated the study three times with similar results. Then they changed the feed at the facility 
all the rats were eating GM soy. Two months later, the scientist asked her colleagues, what's the mortality rate among your rats? It was now over 55%. They were all eating soy. So if genetically modified crops are so bad, how come we don't see more problems? Any of you remember what happened with L-tryptophan in the 80s? It was L-tryptophan was sold as a food supplement. Six companies were exporting L-tryptophan from Japan to the US. One company, Showa Denko, was genetically engineering the bacteria for the production of the product. That almost certainly created the contaminants within L-tryptophan, which were responsible for this deadly epidemic. It killed about 100 Americans and caused another five to 10,000 people to fall sick or become permanently disabled. One of the books I have out there, Seeds of Deception, tells the whole story of what happened. And it's really quite, quite horrifying. And it's pretty clear once they really started looking that it was the genetic modification that was causing some toxin to be produced that then killed these people. It took years to discover that the epidemic was underway. It required a series of coincidences, plus the fact that the disease had three concurrent characteristics. The disease was new, with unique symptoms that stood out. It was acute, so people went to doctors or to hospitals. And it came on quickly, so they went to doctors right after taking it. All three of these had to be required. If one of those had been missing, they probably would never have identified it. What if it created common diseases, such as cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or obesity? It would likely have remained undiscovered and could still be on the market. If it created symptoms that weren't serious, or if the symptoms didn't come on quickly, it might never have been traced to L-tryptophan. We don't know if GM foods, which were widely introduced in late 1996, contributed to the fact that food-related illness in the US doubled between 1994 and 2001 or the fact that the percentage of Americans who suffer from three or more chronic illnesses jumped from 7% in 1996 to 13% in 2004. We don't know if GMOs contributed to the increases in as allergies, asthma, migraines, ADD, and diabetes. We don't know because there is no post-marketing surveillance, no human clinical trials, no proper evaluation of plant changes or effects, and government approvals are based on disproved or untested assumptions or on industry studies which are widely criticized as being rigged to avoid finding problems. So they don't study it. They don't have to study it. Fortunately, this is something we have the very real ability to do something about. I think this whole genetic engineering thing is one of the biggest threats that we face. It's like, we don't know if sometime these genetic modifications are going to transfer from this plant that they wanted in to some other plant out there. It could potentially transfer into other food, other food plants. And then if they actually approve GM salmon, if some of those salmon wind up escaping into the ocean, you can't ever get them back. And it could spread to other fish. I mean, we don't know what could possibly be happening. GMOs provide no benefit to you, the consumer. We all, I believe, probably, this audience knows you shouldn't eat a lot of sugar and you shouldn't eat trans fats, right? But sometimes we may choose to eat them anyway because we want the food that they are in, because it tastes better or the texture is better for the trans fats, right? There are things that the foods that contain those ingredients have qualities that we actually want. We consider them a benefit, so we may choose to eat something with those ingredients. The GMO ingredients provide no consumer benefit, no improvement in taste, no improvement in texture, no improvement in the shelf life of that food. The only ones who benefit really are the biotechnology companies, because they get to sell their seed and their pesticides and herbicides to go along with them. The companies that manufacture our food may get lower priced ingredients if they're you know, using the genetically modified. But if we, the consumers, say, we don't want this stuff, 
then they're not going to put it in. So when consumers realize the health risks, they are highly motivated to choose brands without GMOs. Just a small percentage of the population switching to non-GMO brands will create a tipping point, forcing major food companies to quickly replace GM ingredients. If even 5% of the US population rejected GM brands, it should be more than enough to create the tipping point, since that represents an enormous loss in revenue for the food companies. All they care about is profit. And the biotechnology companies, all they care about is profit, too. Remember the genetically modified flavor saver, flavor saver tomato? And then there was also a potato. They were actually on the market for a little while. But they didn't make money. So the companies stopped selling them. All those companies care about is their profit. Remember we talked about Dr. Pustai and the gag order that was placed on him and then when it went public? Very shortly thereafter was when the labeling thing went into effect in the European Union. And now, EU basically has GMO-free food. So the important thing is to educate. So it's like with the people down in California who are going to vote on this ballot initiative, the companies are spending huge amounts of money to defeat this labeling bill. When we educate the public, people like you and me, we care about what's in our food. We deserve the right to know and have it be labeled. So if we educate enough people, they're going to go out and vote no matter how much the big corporations tell them not to. So it's like educating people. So in this, you know, a little bit less than an hour and a half, okay, how many of you are more informed about this and are able to make choices that are different, right? All it takes is a little bit of education. A very short period of time, you now know enough to be significantly more informed and to be able to help other people be educated. Uh, let's, let's talk about the brochures that you've got. You've got the non-GMO shopping guide. So there is something called the GMO, the non-GMO project. And so it's not, it's like the, the, the second, you turn the second page, there's a little, little symbol there for the non-GMO project verified. And I've actually seen in the stores products that have this label on them. So now that there's been all this demand for GMO-free food, there are companies that are actually conscious enough to choose to be part of this project. And so they are testing their food to show that this, any product that has that label has been tested to be below a certain percentage GMO. Right? You can't say it's 100% GMO-free, because right now that's not possible. But if you could test it and say, I think the number they're going to come up with is 6%, but I'm just guessing, right? Below 6% genetically modified. You can't avoid it 100%. So look for products with that label. And if you go further into the little booklet, you can see there's all these different categories. And in each of these categories, these companies have said, we have GMO-free products, right? If you look at the back, inside the back of the little booklet, not the last page, but inside the last page, invisible GM ingredients. There's a list of all the ingredients that are likely to be genetically modified. Most of them are going to be forms of soy and corn. And I'm really good now. I can tell when I read a label, oh, that's probably corn. Oh, that's probably soy. I don't eat many processed foods anyway, but um, it helps you be able to know what it is. So it's like on here is like baking powder. It's like I bought baking powder yesterday that says GMO free because companies now realize that we people care about it and we're more likely to buy their product if they can say it's made with non-GMO corn. Other ways that you can avoid it, buy your certified organic. Certified organic is supposed to be sourced from ingredients that are GMO free. And again, it's going to have a little bit of contamination, but you're not going to be able to completely avoid that. If you consciously limit your exposure anywhere you can, then it's I figure, you know, I'm not going to be able to complete, particularly if I go to a restaurant ever or eat dinner at somebody else's house. I just know that occasionally I'm going to get a little bit, and I choose to be okay with that. The Institute for Responsible Technology is a great source for information. If you go to the website, and again, the address is on those materials, they have resources pages where you can, um, on the computer, listen to audios and watch videos. If you know people, and you want to send them something that starts to get them interested about this, go on there and watch one of Jeffrey Smith's videos, for example. He does a really great job of giving somebody just enough information to get them like they care. 
And so say, I went to this presentation, I learned a lot, hey, watch this video. And that may be enough to trigger them to start looking for more information. Hybrid, hybridization is different, right? The way, the way plant breeders have traditionally operated is to take one plant and another plant and to breed them together to give something that's crossed between the two, essentially. Right? That's called hybridization. That's the way they, you know, farmers have been doing that forever. Okay? You're mixing plant DNA with plant DNA. It may ultimately create something that causes problems. I mean, that's what's happened with wheat. Right? Wheat's not genetically modified. There are problems with it, but it's not because of genetic modification. That's from the way they've hybridized it. Okay? Well, we talked about the bacterial DNA and the viral DNA segments that get inserted into plants. That's where you get the problems. Plant DNA and plant DNA is not going to cross with bacteria or animal DNA. It's the bacterial segments that then cause the scrambling of the DNA that causes, causes that kind of problem. So uh, yeah, it's really a very limited number of plants that are genetically modified at this point. The goal of the genetic engineering industry is to have 100% of the food being produced from genetically modified crops. That's their goal. And truthfully, I think they thought they would already be there. The only reason why it's not already the case is because people have protested. The European, Dr. Pustai and what happened in the European Union was a big thing, right? That first really woke people up to, it's like, hey, you know, this stuff could cause problems. So because people have said no, that's the only reason why they don't have everything genetically modified. They have test plots. They are trying to genetically modify everything. They're just not released. I was at the hearings for the Washington Legislature and Senate. And in both hearings, the people who were supporting, you know, it's like no on the bill, were saying this is a federal issue. That's true. It really is a federal issue. The federal government should be dealing with this. Yeah. But the reality is that they aren't. So that's why the state is the one that's being basically required by the people to push this forward. Because the federal government that should be addressing this issue is, in my consideration, a big part of the problem. The FDA, I mean, really. Um, Dr. Huber might mention that on those interviews. I don't know on my own. But I do know that the more often it's applied, the worse the problem is. But because what is, well, OK, I do know something about it. Um, over a period of time, the Roundup becomes deactivated. But when they apply um, NPK fertilizer, the kind of fertilizer that is commercially used, it reactivates the Roundup. So that, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to get its influence out of a soil where it's already been applied. But listen to, listen to those interviews with um, Dr. Nicola for Dr. Huber, because you'll learn a lot. All right, well, thank you.